Good morning. <clears throat> I've got good news today. The compiler works. It generates code that runs. It's a miracle. <clears throat> Of course, I'm finding all sorts of interesting issues. <laughs> Okay, let's get into it. Today is Wednesday, August the 1st, 2018. This is the Nibbles IO Daily Programming Stream. My name is Jeff. I write code every day and I stream it on Twitch Monday through Friday. I'm working on a project called Base Code, which is a programming language, and I am in the very early days of this project, so I am building a bootstrap compiler so that I can eventually then rewrite the compiler and be self-hosted. Um, yesterday, I hit a pretty good milestone. I This sample script, which I've been playing with, uh, or this sample source file, I should say, is compiling to bytecode. The bytecode is running. Um, and so we're one half <laughs> of the way to getting to native code compilation, but more importantly, we're at a point now where finally I can start building a test suite to test chunks of the language and the compiler infrastructure, and I've already, I've already discovered all sorts of bugs and other things. So, um... So really briefly, I'm, I'm going to take the if statement out because that's kind of been opened up a new set of bugs. I just started playing with that actually, so. Okay, so here is the output, right? Um, we format this line, we print hello world, we create a variable A and assign Sign it to two, then we do an A S H L. So that's this is a shift left by four. So that's going to give us a result of thirty-two. So we print that out, and then we print this last line here. That works. Now, there's all sorts of jiggery hackery, <laughs> especially with the variadic function. Of course, print has to be the very first thing that you need and variadic functions are interesting. Um, so I, I mean, you know, I'm going to be going through a cycle where I kind of put scaffolding in place to get stuff to work and then we're going to have to come back and clean it up as we go along. But I mean, this is a huge milestone. Um, the interpreter works. The generated code works. We can print strings. The FFI stuff works. So lots of good stuff. 
a um, couple things. One of the ways, or one of the things I was talking about, I think towards the end of the stream yesterday was <clears throat> this issue, at least temporarily, with uh, strings where the address of the string itself is actually pointing at the length of the string, not the beginning of the string data. So I needed an offset of four bytes. Um, the easiest way, I, I enhanced the move opcode in the interpreter. Um, so now it's possible, move essentially can be a move with an add. Uh, or a move with an offset, and the offset could be positive or negative. So it could be an add or a subtract. Um, and that's actually could be super convenient. Now, a lot of CPUs, actual CPUs, don't have this. But within the interpreter, it's kind of cool. Um, because this could be a register. It doesn't have to be a constant value. Um, so, uh, but the easiest way, right, was to recognize, oh, okay, I'm, I'm loading a string here. So here's what the the code that does the um, address resolution, label resolution, that all works the same. And then we just add the offset because it happens to be a string and that gets us around that problem. Um, so, <clears throat> And then I'd put the if statement in here. And that had uncovered a new round of issues. Um, I'm not sure what these other, I think these other blocks are related to types. So this is the other thing. Um, well, we'll come back to that. Um, so if we follow the generated code here, uh, this is our module block, which represents the whole module, the top level. Um, actually, let's, we'll start at the top. So the very first thing we do is we emit a jump instruction that's going to jump to the initializer for the, the program, right? This is the entry point initializer. And then we, because the very first instruction the interpreter needs to see, or the very first thing the interpreter needs to see is code, right? CPUs are the same way. It can't put data here. It has to, there has to be an instruction that you execute. So in this case, we want to vector past all of our data. Um, and then we have all of our data. And this is pretty much exactly the same as it's always been. The strings get in turn. I have that one variable, which is going into the uh, data section. And then we come down here to initializer. So the address of initializer is 14C, 14C. Right, that's where we're going. So we come down here, 14C. Okay, so this is our, the top level, right? So this is our module block. Now, presumably if we had included other modules, depending on what order we did that in, they would, have, they would be emitted, you know, in sequence as well. Um, so we know that kind of, sort of should work, but I'm not testing that right. So then the very first thing we do, right, is, and obviously the foreign um, procedure declaration is just metadata, right? That goes into, hey, SWIL6. Um, that just goes into the compiler, right? And is used when you call that, that uh, foreign procedure. Um, so the very first thing that's code emitting or code generating is this call of print. Okay. So we're going to move I zero with the address of this constant string with an offset of four, right? So it's a 108. So if we go up here, 
108 is string literal 86, and the value of that is new line dashes and this message, right? So again, the first four bytes here are the length because internal to base code strings are like Pascal strings, they're length prefixed. Um, but we also have to interop with the legacy world of C where we have a null byte at the end. So we have to do that offset of four bytes to get here because otherwise, I mean, we could pass this, but you're gonna get garbage at the beginning of your strings. C's not gonna know the difference, right? So, so we do that. We push that the value of what's on that register on the stack, okay? And then temporarily, this is, I'm probably gonna go through several cycles on this. Right now I'm having to push the number of arguments for foreign function calls because of variadic, because variadic. Um, now ultimately I'm hoping to make this much more intelligent. So if it is variadic, we probably will push the number of arguments because that'll just make life easier. But <clears throat> if it's not, if the function procedure signature has no variadic arguments in it, then we can probably optimize around that. <coughs> um, but anyway, for now I push the number of arguments. So we push the first argument, push the number of arguments. Then we call the the FFI instruction, we pass the address of what that uh, loaded function signature is in memory, right? So keep in mind, the compiler has loaded this. We've actually loaded ourselves, right? We, we load ourselves up because that's where that FMT print is at. Theoretically, we could load any DLL or shared library we want, um, but that's running inside the compiler. I should say that image is loaded into the compiler space. So this address is valid within the overall compiler space. Um, and so this then uses dying call to call that foreign function. We'll look at that. Um, and print doesn't have any, doesn't return anything, it's void. So there's no, nothing's coming off the stack. So then the very next thing we do is we load um, the value of F7 plus four. So this is another string literal. So this is hello world with a new line, right? So we're gonna load that address into I0. We're gonna push that, we're gonna push one. We're gonna call print again. Okay, so now this is where we're gonna manipulate this variable. So we move the address of the variable now. Again, this generated code is not optimized at all. <laughs> so we're gonna make it work, then we're gonna optimize it. Um, but right now it's doing a lot of duplicate stuff that it doesn't need to do. But functionally we're get going for correct, then we'll go for optimized. So we load the address of this A variable, which is right here and that's a 32-bit value, um, and which we can see here. So what's, what happens, we load the address, that is a 64-bit value. Addresses are always 64-bit values. We actually load the address twice. We, we load it into I0, because that's for the store. And then we load it into I4, which is for the load. Um, and then we load the value from that location in memory, okay? And, but it's only a 32-bit value, so it's load and double word. So we're loading the value that this points at, which is two, into this register. Then we have a constant um, value of four for our SHL instruction. So we load that constant value, and that's also a 32-bit value, at least the way the, the compiler is currently inferring the type for that literal. We're gonna come back to that. Um, and then we do the SHL. Um, so I2 shifted by I3, and the result goes into I1. Then we store the 32-bit value that's in I1 at I0, at that address.
So this block is what does this part right here, right? This is hoisted and that goes up in that day of decoration um, because this is a constant expression at that point. If I had, so let's, let's make a small change. I'm gonna comment out the if again because that's bugged. So let's say that this is a U16 and we're going to assign the initial value to. So this is different. So now this is a non-initialized variable declaration. Um, so this should just show a reserve in the, in the data section, not an actual data definition. Um, we're assigning it to two then we're doing the SHL. So we should actually have two blocks of code to get generated here in this scenario because the binary as operator assignment is actually code um, generating in this scenario because the compiler can't hoist that yet. Maybe we could eventually, but. So the output's still correct. So if we come down here, yes. So A is now just showing a reserve word. Um, so we're reserving a one 16-bit slot for that. And there's no value there because we didn't initialize it. Um, so then if we come here, we'll see that we're loading the, uh, so 131, yeah. So we're loading the address, right? We're moving to, we're storing it. So that's this. So all of a sudden, hey, Everex, this becomes an actual, this generates actual code in this scenario um, because we've already defined that. Uh, and right now the compiler isn't, like it doesn't say, oh, well, I could collapse those. And it's debatable if we would even want to do that. Um, so this represents this then we come back to this part and it's the same right it does the exact same thing um we load up uh well actually i'm sorry it's that right we get the address for the store we get the address for the load we load the word so notice that the size changed so <clears throat> this was a bug that i discovered like right away <laughs> um because i had basically set everything to be 64 bit when I was generating a lot of this stuff. Um, and so I fixed that, I think f for the important parts. So obviously loads and stores are very critical in terms of the size, because if we just loaded a quad word, we're gonna load too much data, we're gonna get garbage, it's not gonna work right. Um, especially if we had other variables, right, that were stacked next to that, that would be bad. So <clears throat> um, now, you'll notice that the shift is operating on the full register size. You know, I'm gonna make a mental note of that. You know, maybe, maybe we optimize that. Here's the thing, the interpreter doesn't really, everything the interpreter does is on 64-bit values. The, the old, for some of these instructions, the only reason that the size here might matter is when we actually go to generate native code, perhaps. But definitely for the loads in the stores, the interpreter is sensitive for that. Um, so we have to make sure those are correct. Uh, so then we load the address again of that. And this is what I mean where eventually I wanna make the code generation much more intelligent here, where we're referencing the same variable over and over and over again. So. We need to, hey, you know, I've got 64 registers, um, but I only, if I have a, if I have the address of this thing, I only need that once in a scope and I can keep reusing it. Um, but we load the address of A again. We load the value of A again. We push that on the stack now because we're going to actually be making a call to print so this is the first thing that gets pushed onto the stack. Um, we get the address of the string, the format string here. We push that on the stack. Now we're pushing two arguments, and then we do the FFI. Um, 
So that works. Um, and that generates, that runs and produces this output. Um, so that's all super wonderful. Um, yeah, all right. So, yeah, if statement. <clears throat> really? Wow. So, not sure why. Yeah, there's a lot of syntax I borrowed from Pascal. <clears throat> okay, let's look at this. Uh, okay, so here's where we did this. Here's the print for... Um, because uh, single equal doesn't, yeah. Because single equal doesn't really mean compare in my book. Uh, single equal is just, it's an oddity, right? Like it's, it, to me, like if I was gonna use single equal for anything, I would use that for constants, but I'm not even gonna use it for that. It's just not gonna be used, period. Um, I just, uh, it gets too confusing. And the, the problem with single equal as well is that math is, math has a definition for single equal. And so people who come from math or who have an understanding of what equal means for math then are confused by it in programming. And so to me, just keeping that, like that symbol's just reserved and this is never used on its own um, I just think it makes a lot more sense. Uh, but, yeah, it's a style thing, ultimately. Um, yeah, and so, really briefly, right, um, you have uh, type declaration. So this is an uninitialized type declaration. This is an initialized type declaration. Um, obviously you could have assigned value. Um, not that big. Uh, and so this is specifying the type explicitly. It does do type inference, although I need to do a better job at it. It's kind of hard coded right now for a bunch of stuff. Um, so integer types, we, um, we have float types. So we can do F32, F64. We have um, string, right? Um, and we have pointers, so we can do pointer to string, that sort of thing. Now, some of this is, it'll parse, but um, yeah, I don't, I, to me, S just makes more sense, but I don't know. I mean, I think of it as signed versus unsigned versus, I'm not sure what I means. <laughs> Um, but, uh, we can do arrays and all sorts of other stuff there. Uh,
what is this thing doing? Uh, so here's the call to print for this line. Then we load the address of A, we get the value, we move the constant value in the if statement, we compare I0 to I1. If they're equal, we go to 28C, which Yep. We get the string and we call print. But what's what happened here? Yes, this is um, the base code compiler's intermediate language. This is the bytecode that it runs. Uh, so yeah, this is um, what this up here is being turned into. This is not native code yet because the base code compiler actually is gonna support running things during compilation for metaprogramming purposes. So the entire compilation process is essentially built off of this IR. And then as a final step, we'll have a back end where you, you'll have told the compiler, here are the output targets I want for native code. And then we'll take this byte code and generate the native code from it. <clears throat> also, it's not not emitting the else. Hmm. Because the else should be here. <clears throat> so let's do this. have a true branch, we have a false branch, and that is, well, that's interesting, huh? Why is it pointing at the Yeah, that's a block. Why isn't this a block? That's a problem. So this is an equals binary operator. This is a block. Oops, crap. Don't need to do that. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> hmm. 
Yeah, this is good. Boiling it down to very simple cases so it actually runs. I'm, I'm finding lots of little problems. Good stuff. Okay, so we come into the L's. Well, why are we... Oh, yeah, that's not good. Well... <clears throat> okay, so the AST node is an else expression. We have one child, which is the procedure call. Um, why isn't it a block? It's a parser bug, I think. Okay. So, if you fix parser. Okay, so we make an if node. And the left hand side is the predicate. And then we push back the block for the true. And then we look for else if. <clears throat> and Well, we'll come back to else if we don't have any of these. But we do have one of these. Um, ah. Let's see what, it, what we're getting here. So we're going to create the else node, which is nothing special, um, on the current branch, which is the if statement. All right, so here's our if statement. The right hand side is now an else node. Um, and then we're going to do a parse expression or push that back. Token type is left curly brace. Okay. Hey, Dr. Robot. So left hand side is a block. Ah, uh, crap. How the hell is that happening? Okay, yeah, that's... Okay, somehow we are... So there are a couple of ways we could do this. <clears throat> I could just call parse scope here because we know that's what it has to be. Um,
I'm wondering... Though... Let's do... I'm wondering why... So we're in parse code. There is one statement, which is the call to print. We're looking for the semicolon. We don't have any attributes. Yep, we got the right curly brace. Setting the end location of the block. There's no attributes. So this is our block. Okay, so precedence is zero. And current infix precedent is going on. I know what I did. <laughs> Damn it. So that's the problem. Because of attributes, that's an error reporting bug. That should be an error, right? This combination should be an error. But we support that. So, and maybe, I don't know, maybe we get rid of that. Maybe we get rid of the postfix version, I don't know. But that was the issue. I was missing the semicolon. <laughs> because that's a statement on its own. This would terminate that, I think, I think, we'll see. Let's, let's run it and see if that's the case. That's why it was associating the print to it because we, again, we do that with attributes now we could, I think probably the right thing is to review the precedence code. Yeah. Um, okay, so we, we're getting the else now. So that's fixed. Um, I think the solution there is the precedence is So symbol infix reports the precedence of variable. Which 
is all the way up here. And we're passing zero, zero, zero. <laughs> um, while the precedence we passed in is less than the precedent of the infix parser that's on the stack. Um, Precedence up there of attribute. And we only have a prefix parser for attribute. So So here, if we pass in precedence t attribute, right? Because that's the only, if we're going to write associate something, that's, we don't want to write associate anything beyond that or below that, sorry. So if I run that again, this should work the way it did before. Then I'm going to take the semicolon out and I'm pretty sure then we will get get some kind of parsing here because we won't expect a symbol at that point. Okay, so. This is true, this is false, I think. So if it's equal, If it's equal, we're going to go to 304, which is here. Okay. What is black 120, though? Okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I see the issue. Yeah, so the if statement is not, it's not generating a branch properly. Okay, so we gotta fix that. This is, this right here is the code that should be emitting that, but sequentially things are off. So we gotta figure that out. Um, now, if I take the semicolon out, man, it's still. Why 
isn't that an error? I bet that's null. Is zero. Oh, because it's on the if expression. Yeah, I mean, that's going to prevent the right association. I don't know. I need to think about why that's happening. I get it because um, if to write associate. We don't want else. Else is terminal. I 
think that's right. That's why it blew up because by doing that, terminating early on if, it was never going to pick up the else. Because essentially, if you think about it, if is an expression, then you can have an else if expression in there. You're, you're chaining these things from the parser's perspective, although it's still not generating code correctly. I'm doing I'm doing a more complex grammatical destructuring in the prefix parser itself. So like yeah and see I think that might ultimately be what I need to do. I need to break it instead of doing all of it you know, see, it still didn't work. something. Nothing can happen after that. And, you know, we can debate like whether or not. So if it's a semicolon or, if it's not a semicolon, and it's not. Because parse expression is recursive, right? It, it tries to consume greedily as much as it can based on um, prefix, infix rules. But in this, like in the else case, we don't, we don't want it to be greedy, right? We just, we know we have a block. That's what we should get. Okay, so now it, it generated the code that was generating before, but it's not. It's not airing out because of the missing semicolon.
have to, I'm going to come back to this. <laughs> um, Let's just put that back the way it was. And what change did I make? Yeah, let's put that back. Ah. Oh, no. Um, so in parser, let's go to if expression. Yeah, so I think the right thing to do here is to take advantage of what the parser wants to do naturally. I think where I'm running into problems is um, when you have a bunch of things that are prefix parse only, you can get away with like chewing them up inside of another prefix parser kind of like doing recursive descent within the Pratt model. You can do that. However, like else if and else are really, they're right associative, or I should say they're left associative to either an if or an else if, right? Um, and to avoid the issue of what I'm running into here, I need to rejigger the precedence uh, list and like else if and else actually would have precedence um, in relationship to other things and so then I think we would exhaust the these would have higher um, precedence which would prevent us from associating things we don't want so I think that's the fix here but I don't have to break that up And yeah, don't forget the semicolon. That's ultimately what it, you know. So there's an ordering problem.
So I need to figure out. The blocks are being emitted here sequentially. See, this is where, this is where I debated a while back, like, okay, for if statements, should the if element in the model be responsible for doing the emit? If it were, then these would be showing up in the right spot. And this would be, I think that's the solution, right? Um, for that one, instead of having the top level So this should drop those two blocks um, on the output side. Oh, the 120 degrees is for my computer. That's the, I think that's the CPU temp on my Mac. Here in St. George, I think, we're probably gonna get up to like 108 today, be my guess. Um, I don't know, the today, at, ooh, wow. The weather's really changing, holy cow. That's very, uh, well, See, 69% humidity in this area, that's, that's unheard of, right? Like it, it feels like Illinois. I used to live in Illinois around Chicago. I mean, it feels like the Midwest here right now. It sucks. Um, but yeah, the temps are actually gonna be super, what the hell? Friday's only gonna be 77? What the? Wow. No, no, I'm looking at Stevensville. How can that? I was like, what the heck? <laughs> that looks right. <laughs> uh, that's better. There. I was gonna say, what the heck? Um, yeah, it's, it's gonna be 106 today. Um, and yeah, still 27% humidity is still high. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna hit 106. Um, and it's not, you know, this, this summer we haven't had super high temps here because for whatever reason, the weather, um, again, like we're, we have a lot more moisture in the, uh, in the air right now. Um, and it's, it's more cloudy uh, than it typically is, but, um, We've, we've hit 117 here. Um, we don't get as hot as Phoenix, but uh, like, I don't know, what's, what's Phoenix gonna be today? Uh, oops. Yeah, Phoenix will be 110, but they're more humid than we are. That is so weird. I mean, that's just, for Phoenix, that's so bizarre. Anyway, 
Um, okay, changing that to filter those out. Um, <laughs> now, what we could do then is go to if element and then in the on emit here, um, there should always be a true branch, but there may not be. False. Let's see what that looks like. <clears throat> And yeah, for all you folks in Europe, all the temperatures I'm giving are Fahrenheit because we're backwards. <laughs> the rest of the world is, is all agreed on how that stuff should work. And we're just, we're all messed up. Oh, because I commented it out. <laughs> Such an idiot. Oh. Like, why isn't it generating code? Well, because it's not there. <laughs> uh, I'm so smart. Yes, I'm smart. Crap. Oh, okay, wait. All right, well, it's closer. Sort of. We're still generating these. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we know I gotta fix that. All right, so let's Look at measure literal. Okay, so what we would want to do here. is what here we want to go to numeric type and have a static helper
What are you doing? Don't. Okay, so what I had in here before was I had hard-coded um, I had hard-coded U32 as the type that we were going to try to we were going to infer but I did a really super simple narrow to value, right? So given a an integer value, what, what's the smallest type that it will fit into? Um, which this shouldn't be unordered then. Well, does it really matter? It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. find boolean as its own type because that's going to be a problem so if that works the way I'm thinking then this should infer a as a byte didn't. Um. Oh, no, yeah, see, order. Order does matter here.
still doing it. The heck? All right, so there's Boolean. Boolean F32. Why is it hitting F32? Oh, because it's ordering by name. trying to think how I want to do this. It's almost...
Um, I'll, I'll be adding an alias for it. Um, I haven't done that yet. I'm still debating on what I want to call it. I'm not really sure I like Rust's U size, I size thing. It kind of feels weird. But yeah, I'm still thinking about what to call it. I never use the multi-cursor functionality. I'm too old. That happened after my brain solidified. I can't do it. Here, here's, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this. Here, here's a mini rant, okay? Um, first, I'll make an observation, which is a precursor to uh, one of the reasons why I dislike pair programming. Um, an observation that I will make is that if I, if I'm like at a company, you know, and I'm in a computer, and for whatever reason, um, the there's a bunch of people around me. I have made the observation that um, people will shout out editing instructions. Go there, do this, click that. Oh, you know, you can do that, click. 
click the, okay, so the, and then it, like, I personally don't like that. I get flustered. I get distracted. And, uh, and maybe that's because I have ADD. I don't know, but it's extremely unhelpful. Now, this is actually in physical, in meat space, right? It's, it's a little different when people do it, like in chat or whatever, because I can kind of um, filter that, right? Uh, but, so that's, that's one, one observation, right? That in real life, I have noticed that people want to drive and, or they will yell and scream at you while you are driving and um, they will become backseat editors for you. Uh, and there's tons of degenerate, you know, sub scenarios that can happen there, right? Why are you using that tool? Why aren't you using this? Why aren't you using Emacs? Why aren't you, you know, but we'll skip over that whole thing, right? Um, and then of course, that leads into one of the main reasons why I dislike pair programming because if there are two people that are equally skilled that are pair programming, inevitably what happens is the one that's not driving is bored. And they, so then they end up side seat driving, right? They end up side seat uh, coding. Um, the other observation I will make, and this has nothing to do with what I just said, um, I will note that I've watched other people edit and because I dislike people yelling and screaming, like, do this, do that, do this, you know, I don't like that. I don't do that to other people. Um, but one of the things that I have noticed is that people are extremely impatient. Um, and I call it the, the endless clicking of death. Right, for whatever reason your machine is like gone to lunch, it's not responding, it doesn't matter. Like I have watched so many people over the years, like they will just keep clicking, right? And then inevitably when things will come back, it like gets all fucked up because the operating system is queued up like 200 mouse clicks. Anyway, that's a complete tangent, but I thought I would throw that out there. Um, so, Okay, then on to what I would like to call uh, the gray zone um, of editing, okay? Um, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that there is this subset of editing features. It doesn't matter what tool we're talking about, right? I don't care what editor you're using. I don't care what IDE you're using. There are features in that tool that are used very, very infrequently, okay? And multi-cursors and column select and a whole bunch of other stuff, I'm sure, would fall into that category. Now you gotta remember, I'm a guy who has horrible memory. I have ADD. Um, <laughs> And so a lot of what I do and a lot of what I've trained myself to do is habit. And it's just, it's just repetition of the same thing. And one of the things I learned a really long time ago, right, is that um, this pocket, this gray pocket of stuff, it's cool. Like it's, but the problem is I don't have it memorized. I never managed to memorize these things because I use them so infrequently. Like that editing example, that comes up once every three months, right? Or once every two months, uh, two months. So I, for whatever reason, am just not one of those people that can memorize all of these gray areas in the tool. And I call them gray because they're not worthless, but um, they're just infrequently used. So they go gray for me. I can't remember them. And so that, and I think this is true of a lot of folks, right? This is true of a lot of people. Um, 
I'm sure if I were to scour all the features in, you know, C line, I could find 50 to 100 things I'm not using, and it would be cool to use it, right? But if I can't make that habit, if I can't use it frequently enough that it becomes muscle memory, then I forget it. It goes away. And so then even if consciously I can say to myself, oh, this is going to be a big edit. I, I, I know I could do this or that or whatever. The thing is, I can't remember the details. It's not there. It's not muscle memory. What is muscle memory is cutting and pasting and shuffling things around like I can do that. There's no gap between my intention and the muscle memory to make that happen. So if I had memorized the, all these gray features, right, then theoretically I might save myself a few seconds by using that feature, right? But because I haven't memorized them, that means I then have to go to the menu, find it, oh, that's the shortcut key for that. Then I have to click on it, then I, that it slows me down, right? And all of a sudden, instead of being in flow, where I'm just doing my thing, um, then now I'm out of flow because it's no longer me thinking about what it is I want to do and just doing it the way that my, my body and my brain will do it. It's, oh, but there's this feature and I have to go find it. And then now, now you're out of flow. Now you're, you're hunting and pecking for something again. And it's, it's just inefficient. So, you know, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to name myself, you know, Jeff Dickhead Panici, because I guess I'm just a dick, but I, I always have to come back and tell people, like, I appreciate that you know a way to do this 10 seconds faster than I do, but your suggestion is meaningless because A, I can't integrate that on the fly, right? And B, it's gonna save me 10 seconds, <laughs> you know? So, um, and you know, if I know I'm going to be um, editing a huge block of text, right? If I, if I know I'm gonna be doing some huge editing task, then I'll look at, I'll slow down, I'll come out of, you know, flow, that's fine. I'll look at awk or somebody on here, I think, Maybe it was Everex, can't remember. Maybe it was Move. Somebody recommended some online tool that would let you do, you know, bulk text editing. It was pretty cool. Um, that, uh, that's great, you know. Um, sometimes if it's big enough, then it's worth, you know, spending time just optimizing that editing task. But for a lot of stuff, it's just not worth the time. So, anyway. That was my mini rant for that one. I noticed that the latency in this stream is very low, unlike the others. Well, I have the low latency feature turned on, so hopefully that helps. But this is why I find the whole, you know, people, and again, I'm not gonna pick on anybody here, but I've noticed that Emacs users are the most guilty of this. Um, they, they will always constantly say, well, if you were using this, then, you know, you'd be done already, or this would be so easy, or, but again, what they're missing, right, is that I don't know that, or I don't use it enough, so therefore, I cannot be that efficient with that, right? Um, and so that's, that's the other part of it, right? That, <clears throat> so East Coast connection. Is that me being grumpy? Something to do with me? <laughs> uh, grumpy Jeff. Okay.
Yeah, I mean, and again, like, I'm not telling anybody what tools they should use. I mean, I'm the last person that wants to, you know, tell people, do it this way. You know, if people ask me why I use the tools I use, I tell them why, and I totally appreciate that um, there's a reason why Emacs and Vim are so popular. And I use Vim, I like Vim. It's just, you know, um, tools are not magical, right? I mean, they can help, they can be a great leverage, but you have to know how to use them. So, Yay, look at that, it's a bite. All right, yep, boom. Now, uh, ooh, that's not right though. <laughs> Theory run and react, yeah. It's like yesterday, I mentioned that, that thread, um, which is gonna be my, my go-to answer as to why there's no written documentation. Um, and it, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, I don't know. Um, I hate the term constructive criticism because I think that I, uh, for lack of a better term, I, I dislike the term. Not really sure if I can put a finger on why, but it's like on the one hand, criticism's great. I think we should have it. On the other hand, I think like, if somebody's doing something, you know, in their free time and they're making it open source, you know, like the fact that people just dump on them is, amazing to me but you know that's really just me saying damn you young kids get off my lawn I'm gonna call the cops on you um I lost track of what I was doing here no it doesn't always happen I mean that's the weird thing Right, is like sometimes like Hacker News or Reddit can be very, they can be very gracious, very nice, right? Or, or on Twitch, right? It, any of these communities, it can be, the response could be something you don't expect. But then at the same time, it's like sometimes you do get the response you expect and it's like, what the heck? Okay. Um, so, address 131 is here, there's our byte, and we're loading it as a byte, ah, this, why is that, that should be a byte too, in fact, didn't I? Uh-oh, what happened? Not that that matters. That's not right though.
Oh, oops. Is it percent C? No. What's the printf? I guess that is correct, actually. Okay, yeah. That's I think that's why it's not. Uh... Yeah, uh, no. Okay, so something. Because if I make this a U16, well, well of course that's. It's, it's showing it as um, X is hex. So actually, it was right. Never mind. It's just it's showing it as hex. So is there a decimal version of a single byte? Is it that is that the HHU? Okay. That's an interesting format code. <laughs> okay, good. There we go. All right, so the type inference is right. Um, sort of, but I did notice. So we're, we're type inferring on this correctly. Um, because we're getting a byte for that variable and the loads and stores are correct. The move though for this right hand constant. So I think the issue there is what? Binary. because it's hard coded. <laughs> oh yeah.
have to, I don't know, I don't know if I like that interface or not. I might want to refactor to just pass the size in. But that should, so that, um, constant value for um, the shift expression should now show up as a byte as well. Which it does, there you go. So now we're narrowing down on integer constants. Um, yeah, I think I probably would just change this to move constant to I reg. through and the underlying instruction encoding is always 64 bit anyway which is how the instruction actually zones the value or deals with the value would just become move constant to I reg that's better that's better that's better butter parquet
this is going to be a constant. No, I don't use the Vim plugin. Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna wrap up here? So for this, obviously there's some issues with if, which really is even probably beyond like what this simple test should be focusing on. Um, in fact, let's do this. Let's move this in here. because that's kind of a later test. Um, okay, so what's some issues here? Well, for one, uh, block filtering in program on emit isn't strong enough. So specifically, um, um, blocks that belong to procedures should be flagged as such because there's no procedure block in here right now, but it, it would just emit that block because I took out some of the constraints because they, yeah, they're kind of wonky. So we need to fix that. That's one issue. Um, types. 
So basically, um, type metadata needs to be emitted um, by the compiler. Um, type initializers and finalizers. Um, because I should be able, at this simple level, right, I should be able to say something like a type is um, type of a. And then this is now this, and then I should be able to get information about that, both at compile time and runtime. I mean, there'll be some very, I'm looking for a very thin type system at runtime, not there's nothing dynamic at runtime, it's just everything can go back to a type. Because um, I think there's some value in that at runtime, um, especially since we have, I have the concept of like any. Um, Oh, yes. Um, so actually, let's do this. Move this up. So zero. Um, how to encode a spread operator? That is not being done right now. I mean, it's the parser gets it, part of the compiler gets it, but it's not making it anywhere else. So that has to be fixed. Um, by doing this, um, we'll be able to get more advanced stuff going like arrays, strings, that sort of thing, um, plus the type of, right? So I want to be able to do type of. Um, we also, oops, I think want to have an align of which this really would just be a shortcut behind the scenes of type of dot alignment or align because that is on the type. But I think it might be handy to just have some shortcut, right? So for constant assignment syntax, what I have right now is I have constant x equals something. Right? I, this is just very inconsistent in a language. The language doesn't I don't really have much anything else like this. And I really would like to keep it consistent. Um, so what I'm thinking here is we would have either a double colon equal or we would just use the same the the because if you think about it like a namespace um, is a sort of assignment right we're assigning on the left some name and it has a namespace on the right we could i could extend the syntax to where it could really be any kind of constant assignment on the right, could be a namespace, could be a number, whatever. 
something that could be a constant expression, right? You could do foo. Foo. <laughs> and that would be valid. And then the syntax here is if you want to type it, right, you can explicitly type it, but you don't have to. So I think something along these lines is where I want um, constant syntax to go. And then it's consistent, right? Everything is, again, left to right. I don't have any prefix modifiers in the syntax. Um, and now would be at this level where I'm really just very much focused on the type system because I want to refine the type system, get that all working properly because then that's gonna allow me to come back to this one example of calling a foreign function in native code and fix this so that this all works because then I'll have all the metadata to properly do that. Um, oh, and then also, since we're talking about types and stuff, um, array, uh, initializer lists and map on my dictionary initializer lists. So I think for arrays, like if we did names, it'll be something like Type and then I could either do it that way, and then you could have you know one, two, three. Although, again, that's kind of we could infer it so. The compiler could look at all the values and say, oh, they're all the same. So therefore, this is an array of string. Or if we had a heterogeneous array, then this would end up being an array of any. Could do that. Um, that actually might be the nicest, cleanest way to do it. A um, little bit more expensive, maybe, at compile time. But eh. I mean, obviously, you could do this. And then the compiler at that point would assert that this is only an array of string. So we need to do that. Um, dictionaries. Uh, would be, I don't know, I haven't come up with a This is where type parameters probably start to come into play. Um, but I think I would probably do something like, you know, five equal simple eight equal complex, whatever. But yeah, haven't really thought about that a lot. Tuples. Um, there was something else. I'm missing something. But structs, unions, enums, I want to get those working. 8a, where a here would be dot 
and uh, DREF syntax. Um, I had something and I lost it. I hate it when that happens. Oh, I know what it was. Um, procedure call. Verification against type. And also named unordered arguments. So I would like to be able to do, like, so print, right? I'd like to be able to do format. Um, and, and then theoretically, I should be able to then, if I do it that way, I should be able to do this. I should be able to pass like A, B, or A2, 10, 3, and then this is a name, you know, this name matches that parameter. So then at, at compile time, right, we're gonna look at the type, we're gonna say, oh, okay, this is a varietic, these belong to the any uh, spread, format is the first parameter, um, so that, So, yeah, um, this, this one little file is gonna give me a lot to clean up. But the good news is if I can clean this stuff up and then we, this one file will kind of be our test case for that. Oh, I think we also minimally need like pound if, pound else if, um, and if maybe. Or no, actually, let's just do, I'll use blocks. So these would be for static um, compile time evaluation. Um, and we need some kind of an assert. Because what I'm trying to drive to is like the absolute minimum that I need to be able to like write meaningful tests mm -hmm. in base code itself. Um, Cause then what we can do is start creating files that test different parts of the language and the program itself can assert whatever um, conditions that it sets up for its testing. Okay, so that's our to-do list. Now that we actually have stuff running. Oh, yeah, one other thing too. 
So label names, assembler label names need to be qualified. So in our, oops. Like right now, we just have block, whatever, and it is true that we will get the IDs are unique across everything, like all the different modules, but I think it might make it a little bit clearer just for diagnostic purposes to like qualify some of these things so that we know like what module it's in. Because what's gonna happen is eventually we'll have multiple modules more frequently and we'll be like, oh, okay, here's block whatever, but what module did that belong to? So I'm really kind of thinking something like this would be, you know, module 64 block two, module 64, you know, just so things are much, you know, clearer. These would be module 64, string literal 138, so on and so forth. Um, you know, it, just to make the assembly listing maybe a little bit nicer to look at, um, it's not really a change to anything, but um, Disassemble strings as comma. All right, just just to like kind of collapse it up a little bit, because <laughs> as we get more code, right, having a bunch of strings like this uh, is kind of silly um so if i could do like eight across then it would cut some of these down so that the whole thing would be easier to read um Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, at least what I can think of right now. And I'm sure, you know, fixing something, some of these things will beget other things to fix. So, all right, let's look at the old codes. See what we got. So argument list, right? So I started refactoring instruction block. So I used to have at the public API level, a lot of these instructions were broken out by type. Um, and it's just, it's kind of inconvenient to have it that way. It's easier just to pass in what size you want the instruction to be encoded against. So on argument list, I changed that. Now, even this is not 100% correct. Um, binary operator. So the left-hand side of a binary operator is always, or I'm sorry, of an assignment, say that correctly, is always an identifier. So we grab that and we figure out, based on its type, what, what size operation we're doing here. Because again, for loads and stores, it's very critical because the interpreter does use that size information to determine like how much data it should read or write to memory. <clears throat> a lot of the other instructions, it, the sizing is a zoning parameter. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? You know, register is always 64 bits in the interpreter. But if you tell it you're operating on a byte, well then it zones the operation to the least significant eight bits, right? So 
theoretically that means that if you had a register that had other values in it, right, the upper bits would still have whatever values they had. It's not zero extending or changing those. We will have to do that at some point for some things, but um, for a lot of instructions, that's all it really means. But for load and store, it's act because you're actually dealing with memory uh, in the heap, that's, that's real. You have to add, the sizes have to be right. Um, same thing with compare. I change compare each pass in the size. Um, now compare will need to be size sensitive. So um, we're gonna have to fix that because um, again, if you have two registers and there were already values in there for the whole, say they, you had filled 32 bits worth of information and then later you wanted to compare two bytes that were in those registers you don't want to compare at the 32 bit size because that's going to fail. So that will be important uh, for that. Yeah, in the binary operator, um, it's we're not type inferring the output correctly. Um, actually, I just thought of So that's a question to So it's an interesting question, right? Like how how do I wanna handle types? Um, if this matches that, you're good, or, or what? If, if this is a 32-bit value and this is an 8-bit value, do we just implicitly widen this, you know? Um, is there any harm in that? Probably not. Um, but anyway, I need to like really sit down and think about the rules. Um, I think most of the restrictions are going to come in. Like you obviously can't cast numeric types. I think we can probably like widen and narrow fairly reasonably. Um, but if it's assigned versus an unsigned, boom, that's an error. If it's, you know, if it's some other type completely, that's an error. And I think looking at like some other languages, we might end up with like a transmute um, as well, where transmute, it'll do exactly what you tell it. Right. If you say, hey, I have this thing and I want to cast it to that, it'll be like, okay. <laughs> but cast is going to have some relatively strict rules around what's possible. Okay, so that came to my mind there. Boolean literal changed to use the new name for the constant, move constant to ireg passing a byte. Um, I move the if statement to a different test file. Um, I'm less concerned about fixing that at the moment. <coughs> um, in, what is this, float literal, I grab the inferred type and I set the size based on that. Um, identifier, same thing, right? We, we need to know what size when we're doing the load. <clears throat> we already have the type and identifier, so we don't have to go through an intermediate step. We just get the size of it. If 
so right now I, I had made some changes to if so that if itself is managing the emit of the true and false branches. <clears throat> this just needs more work so it can fit seamlessly. So compare, I got rid of the type specific version, you pass the size in, same thing with not, negate, load, store, move. Um, I, I did add a move label to iReg with offset, and the offset can be negative or positive. Um, so that kind of, the move instruction, move constant instruction, or I should just say the move instructions in general, you can, it's kind of like a move plus an add or a move plus subtract, depending on um, whether it's a negative or positive offset. That's obviously gonna have to change on most native platforms. That's gonna become multiple instructions most likely. Um, and we may not really need to generate code like that long-term, uh, even though the interpreter supports it. Um, that's really there temporarily for me to work with the constant string data. Um, so maybe that goes away. Maybe we don't need it or we just we never end up encoding anything like that. So push and pops shrink down because we pass in a size. Um, and then in the module just changes to the op codes and then uh, move label to iReg with offset. I changed this from being purely unsigned to signed so we can have a negative or, or positive displacement. Um, yeah, these are just changes to the API. Yep. Changes there. Uh, integer literal. So again, we're, we're asking, hey, tell me what type you are. And now it's doing that narrow to value. So it's gonna be much more specific. Like, hey, I fit into a byte. I fit into a word. Um, and then we do the move constant and ooh. That was bad. <laughs> this is why I always review my code. <laughs> because I make stupid mistakes. Yeah, I don't think it really impacted it because we're using such small values, but yeah, good thing I caught that. Um, okay. In main, so this is the um, entry point for the command line compiler. Um, so I refactored these, these blocks, right? So I just defer to the end. Like I want, I want this code to always run no matter what right, fail, succeed, whatever. Um, so if we did fail, I print out the results, and then I print out the, uh, I, I finalize the compilation session, which is gonna dump out, you know, the disassembly if it's there and whatever else. And then that just tidied up this output block or the final block here. Um, numeric type, I put the name on the numeric type properties. I added the narrow to value. Um, the map is now just pointers to uh, those structs because I have a vector of the actual structures now because I need them to be ordered. Um, and then the map just points at the right entries. Um, so we can still look things up by name in the map without having to iterate over a list, but we can also use the list and so make types now just uses the list and then narrow uh, to value uses the list to figure out from smallest to largest type, you know, where, where things are fitting. Um, and I'm going to have to come back and deal with signed versus unsigned. 
in the parser, I put some comments in here about BF prefix parser. There's, this needs to be broken apart, essentially. Um, like the if part should be here. The else if and the else should probably be on their own because the way that these work, they're, they're, it's like a, if you imagine a binary expression, right? It's left hand binary, right hand. These are kind of sort of like that. It's like if, then else, 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 if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else. They kind of co uh, cohere like that to make a larger uh, structure. And with it being like that, it works, but there's some knock on effects, I think, that need to be fixed. So that needs to be restructured. Um, in procedure call, I'm pushing the number of arguments as a word. It's just a fixed size. Um, and then I pass in the size here because the API changed. Um, return element, same thing. I pass the size here. Uh, unary operator, very similar to binary. We get the size for the right hand side and then we uh, emit the correct ones. I still need to implement logical not. Um, in the interpreter, I added a static inline function that will take an, uh, a size in bytes and turn that into an op sizes struct. Um, and then in the disassembler for an instruction, I, I treat the offset. So the third argument, if it's constant, um, the way the instruction set works out is it, it's almost, all, well, it is always a, an offset. So I just changed the formatter here. So if that's, if we're on a, an offset column, then it just formats it as a decimal positive or negative value. Um, and that just looks a lot nicer. In program, I added, uh, I'm capturing that it's a spread um, now in the type find result, but it's not, it's not going anywhere beyond that. Um, I did rework some of the logic here for blocks. Um, oh, oops. That's a bug. I meant to put this here. Okay, so that's why they were showing up twice before. There's still other problems, but. So that's in the right spot now. And this, you know, I need to, the way these are being filtered in general, I need to look at that. Um, yeah, and I'm capturing the fact that it's, I spread syntactically, but I'm not converting that into anything yet. I'm not, haven't decided how I want to handle that um, at the type level yet. So I'm going to think about that. I think that's it. I think that was everything I did today. And yeah, well, let's see.
All right. Very good. So I will continue working on that list today, try to get some more stuff going. Um, I need to kind of think about or try to finalize my type model. I think Boolean, I had kind of collapsed Boolean into numeric type. Now I'm thinking it probably should be its own distinct type in the model um, for a couple reasons. One, um, there are some platforms where like the size of the Boolean is different than you would expect um, or what the convention on that platform is. Um, and yeah, and then just having it commingled in with, it is a numeric type, but having it be in there is kind of weird. And so I'm going to break that out. Um, and then, um, tuples and arrays and pointers. I need to kind of finish those off. Make sure at least that I've got it, you know, the way I think it should be and start testing those. Um, and of course then with arrays, I need to add support for kind of the implicit functions, you know, for alloc and free and size and a bunch of other things. So, um, and then I got to figure out on the model what the API is going to look like for generating the initializers and um, finalizers for those types. <clears throat> Again, like as an example, a string, right, right now I'm using the constant data that's in the heap. That data will be there in the native code, but I mean, we actually want our string structure, right, for that variable. We don't want to just point at the raw data. What would happen is for that string variable, we would get um, an actual string that has a size and a capacity and a, um, or a length and a capacity and a pointer to the data and all that good stuff. So <clears throat> um, that's, you know, what an initializer would do for like integer types and things like that. You know, it might set them to zero and stuff, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, so I got to do that and then revisit structs, enums, unions, make sure that those are structurally correct at the type level and then figure out <clears throat> how the initializers will work. So anyway, um, I think that's pretty much it. Let's see, who can we Can we host? Why not do it like C? Um, well, I mean, so Boolean will be uh, one and zero. I mean, if that's what you mean. Um, but the type system will be, you know, there will be a distinct type for Boolean. It won't be just, it's a number. And if it's one, underneath the covers, when you get down to the instruction level, it's a one or a zero. But it will be a distinct type. Um, yeah, with my new schedule, I, I can go up until about 7.30, and that's pushing it. <clears throat> Introverted programmer. <laughs> ah, cool. Technical interview preparation.
Interesting. Anybody have any suggestions? Not a lot going on. MLJ Ware. Let's let's raid that guy. Okay. So we're gonna raid this guy. Hopefully it's interesting. Twitch seemed to break their raid thing. It doesn't give me a status update. Yep, see everybody tomorrow, 5 a.m. Have a good one. If, why isn't it? There it goes.